millions of homes. This is your worst nightmare come true. Communications are being knocked out. We could actually find ourselves unable to do things that we've been able to do for most of this century. And the military are being blinded. There could be a rather catastrophic effect on much of civilization as we know it. All these things have the same cause, 93 million miles away. Violent eruptions on the surface of the sun. Stonehenge was built by people who were fascinated by the sun. It's thought to have enabled them to predict eclipses. 5,000 years later, scientists are making great advances in understanding the sun. Researchers like Nicky Fox of NASA use sophisticated technology to discover its secrets. Scientists now know that it produces heat like an enormous nuclear reactor. They know it has been in existence for five billion years and should last another five billion years. But what they are only beginning to understand is how massive solar eruptions can wreak havoc on Earth. Violent events um, can send bubbles of hot plasma steaming from the sun to the Earth, and here it can cause chaos. We're very interested in what's going on inside and on the surface of the sun, because that tells us about the likelihood of events that can wipe out our modern high-tech systems on which we've become very dependent. Very few people were worried by sun storms until March the 13th, 1989. It was a quiet night on Earth, but out in space, a cloud of burning matter over a million miles long was heading straight for us. Very few people in Canada were awake. Night workers at the Quebec National Grid Control Center had no idea what was in store. At quarter to three in the morning, their monitors registered an enormous disturbance in their power system. Yes, sir. Okay. I come down to 200 megawatts right now. Power cables all over the region were overwhelmed by excess current. The engineers tried to reduce the load, but the surges kept coming. In a matter of minutes, they lost control of the whole system. Power plants over the half a million square miles of Quebec were swamped by excess current. Moments later, the whole grid blew. There were about six of us. And we stepped out onto the patio, which was snow-filled completely. And we pushed the snow off the patio door, and we looked at the city. And already, parts of the city were going out. And we could see different sectors just switching off in different areas. All of a sudden, everything just blacked out. Power was lost to 8 million homes. But strangely, some lights still shone. In my bedroom, there was this reading light that was still on. I was a bit amazed, so I played with the switches, and everything was dead except this one light that was emitting a yellowish light. And it, it seemed to me a bit like a ghost that was in the room sleeping with me. 
engineers worked around the clock to replace the burnt out components and restore power. Some parts of Quebec went without electricity for as much as eight days, forcing tens of thousands of people to live without light or heating. In 1994, another cloud of burning gas approached Earth. This time it was engineers at Telesat, a satellite company in Ottawa, who were in for a surprise. I was in a meeting that infamous day with the equipment manufacturer when I noticed through the glass screen uh, my boss frantically waving outside the, uh, the room for me to uh, come and join him. One of their key satellites, E1, suddenly malfunctioned. All over Canada and America, TV pictures were lost. It wasn't pointing at the Earth anymore. It had spun up or tumbled out of control. It wasn't looking down at the Earth, and then we couldn't carry communications traffic. Without this satellite, air traffic control was disrupted, and many planes had to be grounded. The satellite also carried millions of phone calls. Once it was knocked out, thousands of people in northern Canada were cut off. There's hundreds of communities all across uh, the northern uh, the Arctic, uh, northern Quebec, northern Ontario, and all through the Northwest Territories that were uh, immediately isolated from the rest of the world. If I was in one of these communities, I'd feel uh, uh, a sense of urgency that, geez, what if something goes wrong here? What if there's a medical emergency? It took five nail-biting hours for engineers to recover the satellite. Okay, thanks, Mike. So you have it, Paul. Okay. We're in auto track. You're all set. Relief, great relief that, whew, that was close. Well, a combination of elated and tired, because it was a very long exercise. With the satellite back online, the engineers began to relax. But the sunstorm was not over, and it knocked out another key satellite, E2. I quickly opened a can of beans and sat down in front of the... Uh, uh, television set to do a little channel surfing and I noticed uh, that the sports network had gone to noise. I popped down to the music station, it was gone to noise. I checked the local TV station, it was gone to noise. At that point uh, I got a beep in my phone, a call waiting. It was my boss saying we have an E2 problem. Satellite E2 was even more crucial than E1. And your worst nightmare, so all we go back into the control room sit down, look at the data. What we saw was precisely the same thing that we'd seen the first time. Same failure. Only this time the failure was far worse. The satellite had spun out of control and it took engineers five months before they managed to recover it. Loss of either satellite would have cost the company over a hundred million dollars. It would have meant bankruptcy for the company. Our shareholders just couldn't afford to take that much of a loss. Power workers and satellite engineers were uncertain what had caused these sudden failures. But dotted around the world, there are six main solar observatories which together monitor the sun 24 hours a day. And scientists at these observatories had the answer. Two or three days before each event, they saw violent disturbances on the surface of the sun. What you see is a dark structure that you call a filament it will appear to be rising but if it's rising towards you you largely see it gets dim and then it will suddenly simply disappear from sight so you know that something has happened something has erupted but what is going on in the sun to cause these eruptions the sun is made up mostly of hydrogen nuclear fusion keeps its surface at two million degrees centigrade at this temperature the hydrogen molecules are ripped apart 
producing positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. And these charged particles produce powerful magnetic fields. You can get little loops of magnetic field that kind of poke out the sun, rather like an elastic band. When two loops of gas come together, they merge, producing enormous explosions, some big enough to overcome the sun's powerful gravitational pull. These are called coronal mass ejections. On average, about once or twice a day, the sun will throw out uh, a ball of, of, of extra dense material into interplanetary space. These are very major events. And from time to time, a particularly huge cloud of solar matter heads towards Earth. This material is plasma. It consists of highly energetic particles bound by a magnetic field and it contains enough energy to boil the Mediterranean Sea dry. As it passes through space at two million miles an hour, it rapidly expands. When it nears Earth's atmosphere, it buffets Earth's magnetic field. When it reaches the Earth, it's kind of like a cosmic boxing glove, smacking the Earth's magnetic field and causing all sorts of fluctuations. This process generates huge amounts of electricity on Earth. In 1989, Canada was worst hit largely because the ground is granite, a non-conducting rock. Since the current couldn't be absorbed by the ground, it was discharged into the power system. The power grid is not equipped to handle this kind of invasion, so the equipment just blows and creates this massive blackout. Once the power system was wiped out, the sunstorm continued to generate electricity, causing lights to flicker. In 1994, it was satellites that took the brunt of the huge current. The most likely cause of the failure is what we call ESD, or electrostatic discharge, or a charge built up on the spacecraft and finally let go and, and destroyed the chip. And that charge would come from electrons that come off of the sun. Sunstorms are as old as the sun itself. But today we urgently need to know more about them because of the devastating effect they can have on our technology. At NASA, Nikki Fox is a leading sunstorm researcher. She joined the Space Agency in 1995 after finishing her PhD on the subject at Imperial College London. To get a clear picture of how sunstorms affect Earth, she became involved in an international project called Cluster. Four satellites would give a three-dimensional view of a sunstorm as it engulfed Earth. The spacing between them would vary as they moved around and that would for the first time give us a real sort of 3D measurement of the various different regions around the Earth. The big hope was that Cluster would help us predict when sunstorms would wipe out our satellites and power systems. The reason we need to do that research is so that we can identify which disturbances coming out of the Sun are the dangerous ones and which are going to pass by without causing such major effects. But the most direct way to see the effects of sunstorms is near the Earth's poles. Nikki Fox and her colleague Mike Lockwood have spent years studying the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. A constant stream of particles from the sun, the solar wind, causes faint aurora for most of the year. But every few months, these aurora become intense. These are the result of sunstorms. The easiest way for us to know that a solar event has actually reached us is to look for the beginning of very intense auroral activity. There's a certain ghostly, silent beauty about them.
completely spellbinding. Auroras are produced when charged particles from the sun enter the Earth's atmosphere at the north or south poles, where the Earth's magnetic field offers the least resistance. These high-energy particles strike molecules in the air, making them glow. Sunstorms consist of particularly energetic particles, producing a predominantly green light. The different colours will actually act almost like a fingerprint test. If you see a lot of green, you're seeing a certain excited state of oxygen. If you see a lot of red, you're seeing a different excited state of oxygen. When we get a big enhancement of the green light, we know that there are many more energetic particles around. And those are the particles that generate the large currents and things that can cause so much disruption. The intensity of green aurora is a guide to how much damage sunstorms might do to satellites, but a much more accurate gauge would soon be available. The finishing touches were being made to the last of the components for the cluster satellites. The project had taken 10 years and cost 200 million pounds. But soon, scientists would have a clear picture of exactly how sunstorms affect Earth and how they produce the huge amounts of electricity that wipe out satellites and bring down power systems. The cluster satellites were finally assembled in France. The 2,000 scientists involved in the project were looking forward to the launch aboard a French Ariane rocket from Guyana, South America. All around the world, scientists gathered to watch the launch. The whole community globally was, was glued to, to a screen or a, of some kind to see the launch. As the rocket itself lifted up, I think everybody was just it was a, a, just a whole bag of mixed emotions. There was relief that it was finally on the rocket and going up. There was um, excitement about the type of science it was going to show us. But their hopes were premature. Everybody's dreams just rained down in ruins from the skies. One could not believe that this work had gone this way. A lot of people cried, people were crying around the room. And there was a touch of anger, this should not have happened to, to the community of scientists that were, were gonna, so looking forward to the data to come back. Uh, they'd worked too hard, they, it just was not fair. It just was not fair, it just wasn't right. For weeks, salvage teams searched for the wreckage of the rocket in the Guyana swamps. An investigation pinned the disaster on the rocket's computer software. The Ariane steering controls had been using a program designed for an earlier type of rocket. To add to the scientists' grief, the cluster satellites were not insured. While solar physicists mourned the loss of cluster, scientists in other fields were finding that sunstorms could have even wider effects on Earth and its inhabitants than anyone had ever suspected. Orange understand that some people like to share. TalkShare Plus lets two or more people share one talk plan, one bill, and cheaper calls. The future's bright. The future's orange. Somebody tells you that money isn't everything. He's probably your boss. <laughs> A taxi is a taxi the world over. But what about a hot dog? Do what? Well, in France, maybe it's... Le chien chaud. Or is it... Le hot dog. Shall I take this, sir? Oh, thank you very much. Very nice. Amanda. Isn't that your wife filling up over there? Shh. 
She must have come by now. Believe me, she's out there. It all began with the mail, really. First sending business letters, and then businessmen. From then on, there was no going back. For over 70 years, United Airlines has been rising to the challenge, and together, we'll keep rising. Just as far as our imaginations will carry us. Edition Micro Passion with sunroof, airbag, metallic paint, and Nissan's unique 3 to 1 offer. You better ask before you borrow it. That's the story of love. Getting to know you, getting to know all about you, getting to like you, getting to hope you like me. The better we know you, the more we can do for you. We're Cable and Wireless, Britain's newest telephone and cable TV company. Join in our national customer survey and tell us what we can do for you. It's money. Oh. I denounce it and all its evils. Give me nature, spirituality, and a good woman whose father owns a pub. The causes of extreme changes in the weather are often a mystery to meteorologists. At the Armagh Observatory in Northern Ireland, observations using antique equipment show that this may be because a crucial factor has long been overlooked, the effect that sunstorms have on the climate. Astronomer John Butler works with a 19th century telescope. A clockwork mechanism tracks the sun throughout the day. It steers the telescope from its easterly position in the morning to a westerly position as the sun is setting. Protective filters prevent the sun doing damage to the observer's eye. With this simple technology, generations of astronomers have kept detailed records of sunspots, patches which appear on the surface of the sun. Sunspots are important because plasma clouds emerge close to them, and the more sunspots, the more sunstorms. Like his predecessors, Butler keeps daily records of the temperature. When he joined the observatory, he was curious to know more of its history and investigated its underground passageways. Deep in the vaults, he discovered some forgotten books. Books containing climatic records going back over 200 years. We decided that it was time these should all be compiled and studied. So we made a catalogue of these early documents. And it was at that stage we realised that we had early meteorological material stretching right back until the 18th century observations which have been made on a daily basis from about 1795 until the present. 
this type of material one could think of as a Rosetta Stone of climate change. In recent years, it's been assumed that global warming is due to greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. But the observatory records show that this wasn't the full story. Butler plotted the length of sunspot cycles, an indicator of the number of sunstorms, in blue, alongside the temperature on Earth in red. The two lines followed each other very closely. For John Butler, there was only one conclusion. The changes in the sun are one of the principal causes of the change in temperature of the Earth in recent decades. And this appears to be due to sunstorms. But why should more sunstorms increase the temperature on Earth? Here in Colorado, scientists think they have the answer. And it seems to lie in the clouds. By the time sunstorms reach Earth, they produce little heat directly, but still carry enormous electric currents. And it's thought that these currents affect the water droplets in the clouds. The electrical currents charge up the droplets, especially at the tops of clouds where they are very cold and a very small amount of electric charge uh, has the capability of causing them to freeze. The frozen droplets attract more ice, becoming heavier. Too heavy, in fact, to be supported by the cloud. This leads to rain, often accompanied by electric storms. After a huge rainstorm, clouds are emptied, allowing the sun to heat the earth directly. And this is believed to cause a rise in temperature. Weather researchers have just been told that intense aurora have been seen at the North Pole. Earth is being hit by a sunstorm. This is a perfect opportunity to test the clouds, to see if they're being charged up. At the National Center for Atmospheric Research, they have a plane dedicated to weather investigations. The pilots head straight for the tops of the clouds. Rain droplets from the clouds are collected by tubes mounted on top of the plane. These droplets are tested for their amount of charge, and the results come through in seconds. The higher the reading, the more the drops have been charged up by the sunstorm. Uh, it's going up a bit, 250, mm -hmm. 260, 282. Today's readings show a high electrical charge leading to more ice. If you change the amount of ice that's present at the top of clouds, this can produce quite large consequences for weather and climate. If sunstorms can charge up droplets in clouds, what effect could they have on people? Astronauts can receive high doses of dangerous charged particles if caught in sunstorms, particularly over the Earth's poles. I personally wouldn't be terribly happy about being in a spacecraft that flew through the auroral regions on a, on a regular basis. Astronauts are most exposed during spacewalks. If they're outside, they have almost zero shielding, and the energetic particles that are flying around are similar to those that you would encounter if you were dealing with radioactive materials, and the biological consequences are the same. Russian cosmonauts taking spacewalks during sunstorms have later developed cancer, but it's still far from clear whether sunstorms are to blame. Nearer to Earth, passengers and crew aboard high-flying aircraft like Concorde could also be at risk from sunstorms. Since its launch, Concorde has carried a detector which responds to high-energy particles from the sun. If the alarm goes off, the plane has to descend to lower altitudes. There is considerable concern among the flight attendants and pilots union about particularly those who fly at high latitude to that exposure. You usually find that the airline companies themselves will switch around the crews on a much more regular basis um, when we have particularly violent events. 
Doctors are now starting to ask whether sunstorms could affect people on the ground. One study in Hungary showed that the number of accidents increased during sunstorms. And an Israeli cardiologist found that during sunstorms, many more patients died from the most common form of heart attack, myocardial infarction. Our data show that at the periods of high solar activity, we have more uh, deaths from myocardial infarction, especially in the older population. It's too early to know whether these findings are merely statistical freaks, or whether they could open up whole new areas of medicine. but we shall soon have plenty of opportunity for further study. Solar physicists are predicting that the frequency of sunstorms is about to increase. Within the next few years, we should see a large increase in the number of sunspots, a large increase in all of these things we call solar activity, and then we expect a very abrupt increase in the number of sunstorms. Sunstorms happen most often when there's turbulence on the surface of the sun, and this turbulence is largely due to the unusual way the sun rotates. The sun is, is not a, a solid body, it's a ball of gas, and it doesn't rotate as one single sphere. It moves faster, in fact, at the equator in the middle than it does at the poles. This difference in the speed of rotation causes the sun's magnetic field to tighten up, a process which is just starting to happen. If you imagine just twisting up um, a long piece of string, round and round and round, you can see that the configuration is going to become very, very confused very quickly. At some point in this ongoing cycle, the magnetic field becomes so unstable it snaps. When that happens, that makes it much more likely for explosive events to take place on the sun that throw all sorts of energy and, and material matter out into space. And the more that's thrown out into space, the more that hits Earth. The hope is that in the future, Scientists will be able to say with confidence when a sunstorm is going to hit Earth. Blackouts could be prevented by reducing the current in the grid. Satellites could be saved by switching off their electronics. And up to the minute space weather forecasts could be beamed to our homes. While all you folks are getting ready for football season, we have a sunstorm warning from the Space Weather Center. In this region of the sun, a plasma cloud has broken through the surface of the star and is heading earthward. It will be affecting our northern hemisphere on Thursday. Here's how the storm is predicted to strike the Earth's magnetic field. Satellites in this region will be facing the full blast from the storm, so TV reception could be affected. Bad news for you Broncos fans. On the bright side, we'll see dramatic displays of the northern lights as far south as New York and London. Central to the success of space weather forecasting is a new satellite called SOHO. It will stare at the sun 24 hours a day. To do this, it has to be a million miles out in space, at a location where the sun's and Earth's gravitational fields cancel each other out. SOHO is enormously important to us in that the researchers will better understand solar physics. We can warn people that something is coming towards them, but also um, we can predict the speeds um, with which this is leaving the sun, possibly giving an idea of when it will actually reach the Earth. Five, four, three, two, one, ignition. This launch went without a hitch. The data from SOHO was needed more than ever, and it wasn't just for space weather forecasters. 
for there was growing concern that sunstorms could increase the risk of war. Love! Deep inside the Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado is where the American military monitor space. The NORAD facility is surrounded by 1,800 feet of granite rock on all sides. To enter it, one has to pass through one of the strongest doors ever constructed. It is 20 feet wide and over 4 feet thick. This fortress was designed to withstand a nuclear attack from the Russians. But with the end of the Cold War, the major threat to world security is no longer the Russians. It's the sun. Major Boyette is in charge of a team of space watchers. Yes, sir. What's the status of the uh, sensor network? Just talking to them. They're going to be green for the next 24 hours. Sir, we've got no conjunctions on the mirror. Okay, thanks. You have problems. Each group's job is to track 8,000 objects in orbit around the Earth. Some of the objects are satellites, but many are pieces of debris left by rockets. It is essential for the military to know the position of all these objects at all times. Otherwise, if one of them falls to Earth, there's the danger it could be mistaken for a nuclear missile. Anytime you uh, have an object that's in space and it's coming back in, it has a tendency to look like an intercontinental ballistic missile re-entry vehicle. And so the primary function of U.S. Space Command's Space Control Center here is to ensure that uh, any object that is coming in, that the appropriate authorities are notified, and that ensures that uh, inadvertently World War III is not started. During sunstorms, the Earth's atmosphere expands. This increases the drag on objects in space, slowing them down and changing their orbit. When uh, you have a real bad sunstorm, we start losing track of the satellites because they're not where they should be when we think they're going to be there. Clear. Level three. During these periods, the military uh, goes on the alert. 8025 giving us a 3B flare. Also, the X-rays are rising. Yes, sir. During the last serious one that, uh, that I can recall, it took approximately 96 hours for us to reacquire our satellites and uh, figure out exactly where they were so that we could continue to track them the way we do here. Nearby, at the University of Colorado, Dan Baker studies how sunstorms can damage satellites. He's worried they may affect military operations. Imagine, if you will, that uh, you're tracking these 8,000 and you lose track of them, then another uh, object comes into field of view. You don't know whether it's one of the existing ones or some new object. It may be a threat. The military's official line is that losing track of objects in space is not a major threat. It's of no concern really to, to the United States, or, and it shouldn't be to Russia. And. Uh, Really, all we've lost is the capability to track those satellites that are on orbit for a very short period of time. The statement that there's no cause for concern is really not a very uh, realistic statement. In other words, the whole point of tracking all of these objects and knowing where everything is is to be able to say with confidence that um, we know what's there and if there's a change, we'll be able to deal with it. Most worrying is the possibility that a nuclear strike could be timed to correspond with a sunstorm when the military's sights are down. If a country is intent on military mischief and they're sophisticated enough to understand that solar disturbances could have a, a detrimental effect on our knowledge of what's going on in space, then indeed uh, the worst case scenario would be that they would choose that time in order to launch some kind of a, a strike or some kind of a uh, military action and that of course could be uh, very very difficult to deal with. If anything could help the military, SOHO could.
scientists watch the satellite move into position. They eagerly awaited the data. And SOHO did not let them down. It sent back clear images of the sun's corona, the outer area where sunstorms emerge. The actual light from the center is so bright that you can't see anything else. It's like looking into a light bulb. You can't see the rest of the room if you're just looking straight at the light bulb. So what we do is we put a disk over the sun, very, very similar to an eclipse when the moon passes in front of the sun. And you can actually get to see all the hazy area around it. The first pictures from the SOHO camera showed a comet grazing the sun. and solar matter spewing out into the universe. Although they're very spectacular to watch, in terms of worrying about the disturbances here at the Earth, they're not a problem because they're going to miss the Earth. Soho showed that the active regions on the Sun were facing out into the universe, away from the Earth. For the time being, we could relax. We see sunstorms very often on the sun, and not everyone is going to hit the Earth. If you imagine you've got a huge gun sight, and you've got a very, very big field of view that you can sweep this target through, and you've got a tiny little target, that's the Earth. So to actually hit one, you have to be aiming straight for it. And then on April the 6th, 1997, much to everyone's surprise, the sun fired in the direction of Earth. We saw a huge ejection from the sun and it formed the sort of halo that meant that it was coming straight at us. You can see the circle getting bigger and bigger and this is the sunstorm coming towards us. Another camera on SOHO showed what was happening on the surface of the sun itself. We also saw a bubbling up that looks like water boiling and then a wave, just like a blast wave, which just went boom across the whole surface of the sun. Most scientists who saw the eruption were convinced we would be in for large disturbances when it hit Earth. The scientific community put itself on an alert warning to say this may cause major effects. In Boulder, Colorado, at the Space Environment Center, space weather forecaster Ernie Hildner saw the data coming in. His team's job was to distribute up-to-the-minute reports on the status of the sunstorm to power companies, satellite operators and others, so they could prepare for the sun's onslaught. But Ernie Hildner was cautious of the SOHO data and chose not to issue an alert. The military were monitoring events independently and they weren't taking any chances. They prepared themselves for a period of blindness. Disseminate the alert product right now. Yes, sir. 55th Space Weather Squadron, Captain Groves. That's right. You can expect effects on your communication, both ground-based and satellite. Military leaders in the field could expect interference in radio communications. Satellites could be disabled. Navigation in the air could be affected. And contact with ships and submarines might be lost. NASA scientists contacted the media. And hello and welcome everyone, I'm Natalie Allen. And I'm Lyndon Soles, thanks for joining us here at CNN World Headquarters. It sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, a huge bubble of gas is stronger than you could imagine, headed toward Earth at nearly two million miles per hour. But it is very real. Many people suspected the worst and called for advice. All right. Bye-bye. 
we had a hospital administrator call up and say, of course we will turn off all our computers, including the med medical monitoring computers, at the time the storm is supposed to hit. We had things like, um, will my plants die? Should I switch off my computer for the next two days? Um, should I bring my pets inside? Kennedy Airport people called up and said, should we keep 747s on the ground during the time that the storm is predicted to hit? NASA scientists waited anxiously for the sunstorm to reach Earth. You find yourself waking up at three in the morning just to see if it's arrived or if you can see any signs. It became one of these, um, I don't go to sleep in case I miss it. But after several days of waiting, nothing. No power systems had been wiped out, no satellites had been hit. the biggest sunstorm of all time turned out to be a resounding non-event. Ernie Hildner had been right to be cautious on this occasion, but he wasn't gloating. Almost two-thirds of the time his team get the sunstorm forecast wrong. Often alerts are issued and large storms do not occur and vice versa. So I think it's a, as a prediction, it's something that's in, the in its infancy. If the weather service did predictions of that quality, we might be quite unhappy with it. We don't totally understand the sun, interplanetary earth connection. We have a lot of work to do scientifically before we can fully predict with great accuracy when and how uh, severely the effects on the sun will reach the earth and cause problems. Nikki Fox is on her way to the Space Environment Center. It's her job to make sure that researchers and forecasters have all the information they need. Since so many of the sunstorm forecasts have been wrong, she's keen to find out how NASA could be of more help. By linking very closely with the Space Environment Center, we can provide them with observations which will actually help them make their predictions and then finally their alerts for the effects on the Earth. It is so difficult to see what is actually happening with a sunstorm as it leaves the sun, and we suffered from a lack of information. What's the most important thing that we could give to you that would make your predictions of future solar events easier? I wish we could get the magnetic polarity in a sunstorm that is coming up to the Earth. Not knowing the magnetic polarity of the plasma cloud is why there has been so much confusion over whether a sunstorm would actually hit Earth. When these sunstorms are coming towards the Earth, we still don't know fully what the effects are going to be until we know the magnetic field orientation within the plasma cloud. Both the plasma cloud and the Earth have magnetic fields. If the two fields are in the opposite direction, they combine and particles flood into Earth's atmosphere. But if the fields are in the same direction, the cloud is rebuffed and passes harmlessly on its way. We have, to this day, no way to infer the direction of the magnetic field of the material that's coming up to the Earth. And consequently, whether it's going to be a mere bump or whether it's going to set off a severe storm. But a launch in August 1997 looks set to change all this. It placed another new satellite called ACE into the zero gravity position between Earth and Sun. ACE carries a magnetometer, which measures the direction of the magnetic field on an approaching plasma cloud. And how much do you think ACE will help us? Oh, we have been advertising that ACE will give us almost 100% accurate mm -hmm. alerts and warnings one hour in advance. Customers who are affected by geomagnetic storms will very much appreciate having one hour notice. Mm -hmm. The ACE satellite is now up and running and will soon be put to the test. 
sun watchers all over the world have noticed that the number of sunspots is now starting to increase. This is a clear sign that the sun is becoming more active. The sun's cycle lasts about 11 years and its previous peak was 1989. Its next peak is predicted to coincide with the millennium. We have just gone through the period of the sunspot minimum and we are approaching in about the year 2000 the sunspot activity maximum. At that time we expect to have many more sunstorms occurring. Some of those large sunstorms will hit the earth. In 1989 sunstorms caused hundreds of millions of pounds worth of damage. In the year 2000 the damage could be far worse. Our vulnerability to space weather increases with almost every year that goes by. Today, we rely much more on satellite technology than we did maybe 50 years ago. Um, and obviously, with the more we, we rely on satellites, the more dependent we become. There could be a rather catastrophic effect on much of civilization as we know it if one of these storms uh, occurred at the wrong time, at the wrong place. We could actually find ourselves unable to do things that we've been able to do for most of this century because we no longer have the, the, the necessary tools to do it because they've been removed from us at a stroke. Our only consolation is that space weather forecasters now have a clearer understanding than ever before of when a sunstorm will hit Earth, so at least we can expect it. The Space Weather Center has just warned that the biggest sunstorm to date is on its way. Power outages and widespread disruption to television and telephone networks are predicted across the northern hemisphere. Doctors warn that susceptible individuals refrain from driving or strenuous activity. We'll have an update on the hour. But no one's taking anything for granted. The satellite ACE, with its vital space weather information, could itself become the casualty of a sunstorm. The situation with ACE and sunstorms is very like uh, the situation for an anemometer, a wind velocity meter trying to measure a hurricane. It can be ripped off its moorings and taken away. And unfortunately, ACE out there helping us measure sunstorms about to hit Earth could be in fact damaged by just one of those storms. Now here's the update on that sunstorm warning. The Space Weather Center now tells us that the sunstorm will miss Earth completely. Good news for all you bro- Equinox next Monday night asks the question, what makes a genius? That's at the same time of 9 o'clock. Information about why sunstorms happen and how they can affect our lives is contained in a fully illustrated Channel 4 booklet. For your copy, please send a cheque or postal order for £3.50, payable to Channel 4 TV, to Equinox Sunstorm, PO Box 4000, London W12, 8UF.